Hello and welcome to episode 3 of March to the Sea, the Vandals Let's Play series for Total War Attila. On the last episode, Godegisel and his army, the Oath, eradicated the remaining Roman counterattacking forces, while Visimar and the Children of the Forest sacked the city of Virunum. Both armies then went on to lay siege to the walled settlement of Augusta Vindelicorum, easily overcoming the small Roman garrison and plundering its resources for the Vandal Horde. We set aside our differences with the Ostrogoths, agreeing to a non-aggression treaty. The Huns apparently set their sights on other plunder, as they were also receptive to a non-aggression pact, although they demanded payment in return for their mercy. A small group of Western Roman separatists found common cause with us and agreed to pay us a moderate sum to join us as military allies. The Quadians became our defensive allies and offered one of their daughters, Veneranda, as a bride for Gundric. Godegisel promised his own adopted daughter to Indulf, one of the top lieutenants in the Oath. Although Ingunta subjected to the marriage, her concerns were overruled in the interest of tribal stability. Visimar agreed to take Genseric as his pupil and instruct him in the ways of war. While Gunderic was not able to cope with the stern instruction of his father, who refused to take him on as a personal retainer. Godegisel hired a new clandestine agent in Hethen, who was a builder for the Romans. He and Fredobal proved their worth repeatedly, scouting dangerous areas for our hordes and confounding the actions of our enemies. The Franks declared war on the Vandals and moved their large army commanded by their king Pharamon to defend the far bank of the Rhine. With the route west seemingly impassable, Visimar received word from our agents that Macri and the Alamon king had ridden west and left his walls undefended. Although he may have done so on the basis of false information planted by Hethen, Godegisel saw this as nothing less than divine intervention, and ordered Visimar to take the settlement, raining down fire and stone with our newly constructed onagers. With the Alamans subjugated, the Franks retreated north, and the Vandals crossed the Rhine, meeting no resistance whatsoever. Godegisel liberated the Gallic people living under the Roman yoke at Argentoridum, gaining yet another ally in the war, and our armies now move into the heart of Gaul. Godegisel has begun to see his recent victories as personal successes and has unfortunately developed the arrogant trait, which will cause him to accumulate personal influence at a slower rate. The loyalty penalty should not have any impact for the faction leader. Now we have our two migrating hordes encamped on either side of the border between Argentoridum, held by our Gallic allies, and Roman-held Visancio. The larger Frank force retreats further north back toward Frisia. There is also a smaller army moving southwest of our position, although I don't think it poses much of a threat. However, Fridobal moves in that direction to scout the path ahead. Godegisel sacks Visancio, taking minimal losses and encamps near the border. Visimar moves to the opposite side of the border, outside of Lugdunum. More traditions are available for the Oath, who acquire epic camp following and improve domestic devotion for upkeep cost reduction and improved growth, respectively. The Franks agree to a peace treaty and offer to pay a small sum, although they are unwilling to make it a lasting agreement without a large monetary commitment My from us. At this point, I think the last yours. thing the Franks really Can want is a war with us, us, so we'll keep our money for now. On the other hand, I decide that a defensive alliance with the Visigoths, who are seen moving deep into Italy, is worth a moderate-sized payment. I think this convinced the other goth tribe, the Ostrogoths, to also agree to a defensive alliance, this time without any money changing hands. It seems that Indolf's loyalty has been slipping a little, and I have to pay him a small bribe to keep him happy. This is unfortunate since he seems like such a promising candidate to lead an army in the future. Fridobal keeps moving southwest and not really finding any significant resistance to our advance, so I decide to press on through Gaul. Hithen explores the northern portion of Gaul, and likewise finds almost nothing in the way of Roman resistance. I know that the Roman army is still quite strong in spite of our previous victories, but I do not know where their forces are. Godegisel sacks Lugdunum for a handsome profit, and Visimar moves inside the borders of Avaricum, just to the edge of a small river. In the intern phase, we see a moderate-sized Roman army chasing off a smaller Frank force that we saw earlier but this must only be a fraction of, of the Roman legions remaining. By the fall of 398 AD, 
Our Imperium level grows further, although we are not able to take advantage of any of the benefits while we remain on the move, migrating. My scouts have moved almost to the western edge of Gaul and have found no threat. Unless there's a Roman force in Iberia, we should be able to pillage the countryside at will. Visimar assaults and then sacks Avericum. After taking what he wants, he puts the settlement to the torch. I've decided to place some scorched earth between my future capital and the heart of the Western Roman Empire, giving them nothing worth defending should they decide to eventually send an army to this area. Gotagiso follows suit in Lugdunum, taking the remainder of the valuables for the oath, and then leaving the city a smoking ruin. The children of the forest add the domestic devotion and wardens of the tribe traditions for integrity and growth. We finish the labor service civil technology, so I go back to researching defined military obligation so I can eventually improve our spear levies. I try to convince the Huns to join the war on the Western Roman Empire, but they demonstrate only mild interest in spite of their professed hatred for the Romans. In the end, they refuse to join. Genseric has an illegitimate son, which is the first of the next generation in the royal family. I'm sure that Genseric will not treat the child coldly, having been raised a bastard himself. Bismar requests to marry a woman of our own tribe, although not from Godogiso's line. Godogiso gives the marriage his blessing. He feels unable to deny his oldest friend and most trusted ally. Bismar's brief wedding ceremony is conducted in Bertigala, after the tribe moves there and encamps for the winter. Visimar has become drunk on power, feasting on the spoils of war at his sham wedding. For we all know he keeps a slave girl in his tent, and it is she who scatters the petals before his bride, just as he has scattered the ashes of our enemies on the wind. I must keep watch over the captives in their cages, and so must send my regrets. I'm glad he's on our side, but I do not know who we've become. We must find our new home soon, or lose our way. Bismarck commissions the Bone Carver Artisan Improvement, which provides substantial income and should pay for itself in a few turns and Godegisel begins building hostage pens to house our numerous captured enemies. We've managed to send word to the Eastern Roman Empire, welcome. with whom we currently Speak have no quarrel. They first agree to a non-aggression pact, and then it becomes apparent to me that they're not on good terms with the Western Roman Empire. They have a trade agreement, but no alliance. Surprisingly, it only takes the suggestion from Godegisel for them to sever their lucrative trade ties with the Western Roman we Empire. They are initially unwilling to declare war on their old ally, but with the deal sweetened with a large sum of gold, they agree to go to war. Although it cost me 2,000 gold, I feel that even Although the threat of war with the Eastern Roman Empire should keep the Western Roman Empire's attention focused in the other direction. It's now the spring of 399, and there's a Roman priest, Gaius Lurco, harassing the Swabian horde outside of Aqua Sextii. Fridobal attempts to put an end to his preaching for good, but succeeds only in wounding the man. Bismar sacks and raises Bertigala. I had considered keeping these settlements, but I want to settle further southwest, beyond the Pyrenees, and I have no interest in returning to Gaul in the near future. Meanwhile, Godogisol sacks Vienna 
and liberates the Septimanians, who overthrow their Roman masters and set up their own capital in Vienna. The Septimanians join our growing list of allies, which now include three defensive allies, seven military allies, and one tributary state. We remain at war only with the Western Roman Empire. Odegisel has reached level 5 and has been able to work his way to the war chief skill. As the weather turns warmer, we receive word from our Ostrogoth allies about the movements of the Western Roman legions. They seem to be consolidating in northern Italy, and one legion forces Vithericus out of Verona while another moves to defend the coastal town of Genua. We receive an objective to declare war on the Roxolanians. I doubt they could actually harm us at this point, so it might just be easy money, but I'm trying to stay focused on our goal of settling in Iberia. Visimar massacres another Roman garrison at Elusa and raises the small settlement. He improves his skills and I notice that he's acquired the arrogant trait. It seems our unopposed march through Gaul has instilled both of my commanders with some disdain for their enemies. Hethan moves into Pompileo, which is currently held by Hispania. They've asked me several times for a non-aggression pact, but I've not agreed to it since we both know what's coming. For all the times he's denied his own son the retainer appointment, Godegisel readily accepts his son-in-law Endulf for the position. Fridobal moves east into Italy and attempts to hinder the Roman legion at Verona to give some assistance to our Ostrogoth allies, although he's unsuccessful. The Roman priest Gaius Lurco is again out preaching, this time near Narbo, and Hethan shuts him up again, albeit temporarily. Godegisel makes off with a tremendous amount of loot from the sack of Aqua Sextii, which he then raises to the ground. A man comes before Godegisel at the tribal council, claiming to have brought a gift. But, ever wary, Godegisel feels that tribute such as this is very suspicious, or at least unworthy of a man, so he orders the man to be executed. During the intern phase, we see that the Ostrogoths have finally settled, and their new capital is Verona. Given that this is immediately adjacent to the Roman capital of Mediolanum, this situation seems very unstable. We're now in the winter of 399 AD and we've finally finished Define Military Obligation, which will allow me to upgrade all of the spear units substantially. There are now several choices available to us. I finally settle on the civil technology Local Traditions, since that will allow the construction of Tier 3 cultural buildings that all have some very nice bonuses, and frequently allow the recruitment of special units. It also gets me closer to the Warlord's Hold, which lets me recruit champion agents. I take a moment to review the objectives for Chapter 1, to see how many we were able to include. We far exceeded the bonus objective for looting settlements. We did research labor service in time. We are still currently migrating, and we did sack Augusta Vindelicorum, in fact more than once. Only the fifth objective was not completed, which required us to maintain a military presence in some of the German provinces. I'm not sure about this objective since it's called Westward Ho, but it is actually far to the east of us now. In any event, we should get a tremendous boost to our money at the conclusion of this chapter. The Children of the Forest trespass in Pompileo, and go to Gisel Sachs Narbo for only a small amount of money. It seems that the Swabians have already taken the best plunder. As we pan around the map, we see that the Alamans are now also taking their fight to the Romans in the territories west of the Rhine. The Franks finally agree to a non-aggression pact, friend. although it's a bit of a moot point by now. In addition to his arrogant trait, Visimar has developed a few other nasty traits which may or may not be beneficial for him given his line of work. He's also apparently received a disfiguring scar at some point. He has the looter trait which gives him a very small bonus to sacking, raiding, and looting. In addition to the captive cages and the bone carver, Visimar has taken to keeping a young barbarian slave girl in his tent. Our leaders seem to be getting progressively more depraved as the pillaging of Gaul continues. I cancel Indolf's appointment as Godegisel's retainer in another attempt to have Gunderic accepted. They made ready for war. 
the world had fallen into shadow. The earth grew cold, and the wind whispered of death. And I beheld a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of scales in his hand. Attila was born. All knelt before him. For they knew he would devour the earth and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Attila was born from darkness and despair. It is now spring of 400 AD and Attila has been born although he won't come of age for nearly two decades. As predicted, we achieved four out of five objectives, earning a healthy sum of money. Looking at the new objectives for Chapter 2, in addition to surviving until 420 AD, there are four possible bonus objectives which include being at war with three factions, forge a defensive or military alliance with any faction, maintain a military presence in Maxima Sequinorum and Belgica, and loot or sack five settlements, including those listed. Unfortunately, the fourth objective is not going to happen as two of these have already been raised and the third was liberated and is a military ally. This objective is titled The March Through Gaul, which I'm afraid we already completed, so we were a little early to the party to get this bonus objective. The third objective to occupy Northern Gaul is technically possible, but I doubt we'll accomplish it since it takes the focus off Africa and the Mediterranean which is what I'm really after. Nevertheless, the first two should be an easy reward of 2,000. Reviewing the victory objectives, we are reminded that a minor victory requires 30 settlements to be held by the Vandals and or their allies, including the entirety of the provinces of Galicia and Bitica, which are both in Iberia. We'll also need 10 technologies, 25,000 wealth from buildings, and a total of 60 military units. Of course, we have to survive to 425 AD for any of this to matter. With the minor victory achieved, we can start looking forward to the higher tier victory conditions with the important points to consider now that we'll have to expand to at least to Africa and survive until 450 AD. Gaius Lurko is becoming a serious thorn in our side, as he's managed to persuade Hethan at least partially. Thankfully Hethan did not desert our faction as he continues to be a very useful asset for the Vandals. Godegisel hears of Hethan's near defection and gives him an ultimatum. If he kills the heretic priest, then he is free to continue his work in the name of the Vandals. Otherwise, Godegisel will hunt him down and kill him. Hethan agrees to finish the man, and subsequently Gaius Lurko is never heard from again. Hethan improves his skills, adding observation and surveillance. I think he'll tend to operate more within our borders due to his unique builder skill. Fridobal moves to escape from Italy, since we have very little we can accomplish there right now. Once again, Gundaric is rejected as a retainer to his father. It seems he was not meant for war. I decide to just put Indolf back in the position. Had you allowed your opponent's weak backhand to strike you, he would have left his defense wide open and the match would have been yours. Instead, you're defeated. True, it would have broken your nose, but that's of no concern. You care too much for your vanity and your coins and your common labors with the craftsmen. Do not forget who I am or what I've done for our people. Your foolish superstitious wife warned me of death at the hands of the Franks. I should have her tongue cut out for her heresy if it would not sour our ties to the Quadians. I'm Godegisel, King of the Vandals. Do not presume that you would be welcome to serve in my retinue. You will have to earn your rank by combat. The children of the forest move into the Iberian Peninsula. We're now getting very close to where I want to settle and it doesn't hurt that we now have a fantastic amount of money saved up to ease the transition. Many Roman buildings will need to be converted which takes considerable time and money. Bismarck crushes yet another small Roman garrison at Caesar Augusta, sacking the settlement. 
Odegisel moves along the southern coast of Iberia towards Terraconensis. I put him into raiding stance initially, but there's little incentive to do so, and I decide to encamp instead. Following the intern phase, we move into the summer of 400. Endulf has regained his position as Godegisel's retainer. Bismar is forced to sack Caesar Augusta for a small gain just to open the road south for his horde. As you can see from the unit sizes, the battling and pillaging is starting to take its toll on our troops. Nevertheless, I was hoping our momentum would carry the children of the forest through Segobriga, although we can't quite reach it. Godegisel and the Oath continue moving toward Terraco. In spite of my earlier move, I spent a turn moving Fredobal back into Italy in order to lend some assistance to the Ostrogoths, who have taken up a somewhat precarious position at the northeastern edge of Italy. The following turn, Fredobal has great success in misdirecting a large Roman force that is closing on Verona. I hope this will give them a little more time for defensive preparations. As a result of his experiences, Fredobal improves his skills going the comparatively offensive route, including corruption and civilian infiltration. Bismar sacks Segobriga, and the children of the forest are now free to move toward Carthago Nova, although I encamp on the northern bank of the river to replenish our forces. Godegisel moves into Terraco and puts the city under siege. I could take the city this turn, but I want to wait until Visimar is into position. At that time, we'll seize and occupy both cities simultaneously. During the intern phase, a small Roman fleet moves from Malacca to the docks of Carthago Nova to join the defensive forces there. Meanwhile, to the northeast, Roman rebels seize Augusta Trevorum. The children of the forest are not at full strength, but I think we should have a strong advantage given the additional units that were recruited, the small fleet stationed at Carthago Nova notwithstanding. Given the moderately depleted state of the spear levy units, I decide that now is a good time to upgrade them to the heavily armored Germanic spearmen. With that done, I move on Carthago Nova. Although Visimar is sufficiently skilled to pull off a night assault, the balance bar doesn't show any benefit. Although the odds are quite favorable, and I'm almost certain we would not lose an auto-resolve, I decided to fight this battle to see if we could preserve more of our men. Carthago Nova is a fairly well-defended coastal city with stone walls and numerous towers. With only one onager and no additional siege equipment, I can probably only make one or two breaches for my army and perhaps eliminate a tower. The enemy apparently expected an assault from the east, as that turns out to be where the bastion onager is located, but crafty old Visimar has taken the time to move around the settlement and deploy on the west. Things start out slowly, with the army patiently waiting as the onager takes pot shots at the defenders' gates. The enemy admiral, Marcus Plancus, lands his small force on the western beach. His marines and skirmishers head straight for the gate, and although the marines are too far in front, my archers are able to pick off a few of the skirmishers before they reach the safety of the walls. Marcus Plancus, on the other hand, turns to face our army in what is clearly a suicidal move. By now, the onager has destroyed the western gate and starts firing on adjacent section of wall to make an additional breach and hopefully force some of the enemy off the ramparts. The archers move back and a unit of our newly equipped Germanic spearmen move out in front and form a spear wall, a closely packed row of raised shields bristling with spears. Two regiments of Germanic warband move in to flank the enemy admiral, charging him in the flank and the rear. His marines are holding up remarkably well, and I move in units of cavalry, and Bismarck himself moves up to direct the carnage. Finally, with the marines shattered, and my onager out of ammunition, our only options now are a frontal assault on the settlement or a tactical retreat. Unfortunately, the onager could not complete the breach adjacent to the gate with the wall at 98% damaged. Undeterred, Bismarck orders the army forward, and the attack commences. I move in with the spear units on the front lines given their large shields and heavy armor, not to mention the unit of cavalry guarding the open gateway. Although one of the towers was destroyed as collateral damage while the wall was under bombardment, 
there are still three towers that will be constantly raining arrows down. My other concern is the unit of skirmisher marines who made it into the city. In retrospect, it was a failure on my part not to take advantage of the opportunity presented to me when they were moving into the city, as I held my cavalry back from the range of the towers even though the javelins are likely to do much more damage. I try to force the javelins off the ramparts by pouring arrows into them. They are already a bit depleted at roughly three quarters strength. The first regiment of spears forms up ranks in front of the wrecked enemy gatehouse and then charges up the slope at the cavalry at the top. As a huge melee begins in the shadow of the western gatehouse, Vizimal moves in to command his troops. By virtue of our excellent new spearmen and the sheer number of troops in the local area, the Roman scout equites are quickly shattered and our troops are taking command of the gatehouse, which will at least eliminate the arrow fire from the closest tower remaining. The troops on the northern side of the gate seem to be milling about in confusion and the javelins are fortunately not settling on a particular target as they move back from the ramparts. The arrows are now coming in thick as they arc over the wall. Although we're suffering from a severe bottleneck in moving our troops into the city at the gate, it's really only a matter of time now and attempting to minimize the casualties until I can put enough troops into the settlement. I'm able to finally get the spears out of the way and the Germanic warband units are moving in to engage the enemy infantry. After they suffer an incredibly bloody assault at the hands of the axe-wielding Germanic warband units, the enemy skirmishers waver and break, and the tide starts to turn, panic spreading through the enemy lines. As my axemen crash into the enemy units, a full-on rout begins, and I end the battle before the towers can do any more damage. We lost nearly 500 men in the assault, which is certainly far more than I was hoping. Although we were able to decimate an enemy fleet, including Marcus Plancus and his extremely experienced triple gold chevron retinue of heavy marines, Vizimar orders a peaceful occupation. In the aftermath of the battle, Vizimar merges a few of his Germanic spearman units to strengthen their numbers. The Children of the Forest further develop their domestic devotion and epic camp following traditions which will help with local province growth, agricultural wealth, and military upkeep cost reduction. Vizimar sets the now settled horde to work, repairing the relatively minor damage done during the siege of Carthago Nova. With the migration ended, Udagisal and the Oath move on Terraco, facing only the local garrison, although the Western Roman Emperor Currently, but soon to be deceased, Vesuvius Cassius Clarus is commanding the defenses, perhaps having fled the Ostrogoth onslaught in northern Italy. Given Godegisel's disdain for his Roman enemies, the balance bar being heavily in my favor, not to mention my substantial losses in the assault on Carthago Nova, I decided not to dignify Emperor Clarus's presence with a battlefield assault, but rather unceremoniously disposed of him in a balanced auto-resolve. We lost 400 of our own men in the process, which although not insignificant, is not much worse than the result of my efforts at Carthago Nova given the circumstances. Ready for further orders. The Oath also improved their traditions and now they get guerrilla warfare and ruin of Rome, at this point being essentially identical to the children of the forest with respect to their traditions. Hethen moves into Carthago Nova, to provide his expertise to the settlement rebuilding. With the Gepids moving in from the east and Mediolanum under siege by the Western Roman separatists, Fridibal again starts making his way out of Italy, stopping on his way at Genua to attempt to poison the settlement food stores, although he's unsuccessful. Examining the Carthaginensis province, there is currently a food shortage, and most of the bulk of the public order penalties are due to the recent occupation. This should all improve dramatically by the spring of 401. The religion is almost a majority Latin Christian, with only 21% Aryan Christian. Godegisel orders the repair of the damaged buildings at Terraconensis.
Among the petitioners to his throne is the commander of a local mercenary company, Appa, who offers his services up front. I think we'll continue aggressively occupying settlements in Iberia, so his services may be useful, particularly as what little horde infrastructure I had now has to be rebuilt in the settlements. So I decide to press my luck with him and ask for a discount. He then sets about assigning governors for the new Vandal provinces. Even though he passed over Gundaric more than once for his lack of military aptitude, he's a prime candidate for a province governor. Odegisel installs him at Terraconensis while he gives the governorship at Carthaginensis to Giselic, an outsider from the other Vandal nobility who is apparently a dispassionate, calculating man with experience as a dignitary, somewhat charismatic in spite of his icy demeanor. He does bring his personal artist to assist with the reconstruction which should help with our public order problems. I think he would make an excellent candidate for adoption into the family. That will help expand our pool of available candidates from the next generation of the family. Finally, Galsfintha attempts to gather more support for her husband. Before we conclude this episode, I'll take a moment to examine the campaign map. We see the core of the new Vandal Kingdom in Iberia at Terago and Carthago Nova, garrisoned by the Oath and the Children of the Forest, respectively. Northern Spain remains in the hands of Hispania, while the remainder is still controlled by the Western Roman Empire. A likely target for our next assault will be the city of Cordoba, another province capital, while the provinces of Terraconensis and Carthaginensis stabilize. In Africa, we see the Getulians are besieging Caesarea. Italy is still firmly in Roman hands, although the Visigoths are moving in from the western coast, while the Ostrogoths, Western Roman Separatists, and the Gepids move in from the north. Our ally turned tributary, King Macrian of the Alamans, has pushed into northern Gaul, to which the Western Roman Empire is barely clinging. As we zoom out, you can see that most factions aside from the Western Roman Empire are either friendly or neutral toward us. There is quite a bit of Latin Christianity as well as Greco-Roman and Celtic paganism in Iberia, where we have settled, so our work is cut out for our Aryan Christian priests. Unfortunately, our rampage through Gaul has wiped civilization from the most fertile lands, so perhaps I will regret the decision to raise southwestern Gaul, although I think it makes sense given our goals. Perhaps we will repopulate those lands in the future. I'll let the Vandal people settle into their new kingdom and bring this part of the journey to a close. However, thank you for watching and please join again as we continue our conquest of Iberia in the next episode of March to the Sea. <laughs>